My name is Julie. I'm 15 years old and I'm an Ear Hustle listener. The following episode of Ear Hustle contains language that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Discretion is advised. Hey, Erlon. Hey, what up, Notch? You know, since the beginning of Ear Hustle, we have always been about getting voices from inside prison out into the world. And I think we've accomplished that because from my last check, we're worldwide. Yes, we are. But there are other ways to do that besides the podcast. You know that for the last, I think, eight years, I have been working really hard on this photography project inside of San Quentin. Yeah, you actually started that before we even thought about Ear Hustle. That's right. The project involved a small group of men inside San Quentin and myself looking at and writing about photographs from this amazing archive of images taken at San Quentin from as long ago as the 1930s. Yeah, we even did an episode based on that called This Place in Season Numeral 3. I'm looking, I'm looking at a picture. It looks like a training photo for people that escaped. It's uh, probably the back of a truck. There's a bunch of boxes of cans that are empty. They're tomato cans. And inside these tomato cans is a cleared out space where it looks like an inmate sitting to escape. And uh, I've known a few people that escaped from there. You, ha- you do? Yes. Oh, can you tell <laughs> Uh, well, there's one dude named Red. I'm not going to use his real name because he ended up getting killed here. But uh, Red escaped in a truck kind of like this, just like this. Erlon, there are so many damn stories to tell. And this book that I've been working on based on the photo archive project is finally, finally being published by Aperture Foundation. It's called The San Quentin Project. And I got a sneak peek at it. And I got to say, partner... It's a fly-ass book. Oh, thanks. I really appreciate those words. I have to admit, I am quite excited about it. You can find out more about the book and where you can buy it in our show notes on our website, earhustlesq.com. Okay, Erlon. Hey. Let's get to the show now. I'm still looking at the book, (laughs) Nige. Thank you. Nige. Yes? You know, this is one of my favorite episodes we do. Well, tell me why. I mean, I know why it's one of mine, but I want to hear why it's one of your I love favorites. when our listeners get involved in what we do. Yes. You know, yes, I yes. love it on social media, and I definitely love when we do this episode of Them Asking Questions. And that's what we're going to do today on Catch a Kite. And we've been doing it since uh, season one, actually. Indeed. Answering those questions. I'm Erline Woods. And I'm Nigel Poor. This is Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. Hi, my name is Danny from Toronto, and I'm just wondering if any of the inmates keep up with reality TV as it airs and how easy that would be. This is the first of a couple questions we got about media and entertainment in prison. And for this one, we thought we'd bring our producer, John Yaya Johnson, into this fold. Yes, Yaya. I believe you were one of those big brother guys when you were inside, right? Oh, absolutely. Big brother was one of my mainstays in prison. Why? Because it got me through a lot of stuff, right? I would look at big brother, how individuals are confined to a small space and how they would strategize on big brother. Orchestrated moves and backstab and cutthroat people. And it's about survival. It wasn't a hard stretch to the imagination to see that stuff happening on a prison yard and correlating it to what we saw in Big Brother. Well, Yaya, I have to say, you are not the first guy I've heard talk about their affection for reality TV. It's actually pretty popular in prison. Definitely, Nige. Reality TV shows in prison are super popular. I mean, shows like Survivor, Big Brother, you name it. In fact, me and my celly used to love Big Brother, and we had a ritual that we would do every time Big Brother came on. What did you do? So we would, like, make a spread, go into the bunk, into the into the sweet box, get some zoom zooms and wham whams, <laughs> and just talk, talk Big Brother shop. I love that. What about The Bachelor? Because that was super popular outside. 
Yeah, it, you had a lot of people watch The Bachelor. Me, personally, I never watched it because they didn't have a Black Bachelor and there was always controversy centered around that. But mm. when they did have a Bachelorette that I thought was cute, I would tune in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hear you. So yeah, Nigel, guys inside can't get enough of that reality TV show stuff. And so we got our colleague inside San Quentin, Rasan New York Thomas, to hit the yard and ask some questions about it. Do we watch reality TV shows in prison and which ones is more popular? Yeah, my name is Dan. Uh, I've been down on almost 21 years. Reality TV shows, well, they got one five channel. You know, it's kind of like Survivor Games. Are you talking about Tough as Nail? Tough as Nail's is good. Tell me you wasn't watching Love Island. Uh, I did for a minute and I got bored, man. And I shook, I shook that. <laughs> now, I got I, bored. What you get bored of? The bathing suits? No, nah, I just got bored of, of the drama. You know, it's too much drama. It's, you know, it ain't no real player. Pretty much backstabbing Island, huh? A whole lot of backstabbing. And E, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of TVs inside prison. Yes, uh, pretty much everybody got a, a TV. And if they don't have a TV, they sell it, got a TV. And if you're in a dorm room, there's usually a TV room or TV area that you can watch it in. How many channels are there? It all depends on where you're at. <laughs> you know, in some prisons, you might just have a couple of channels. But if you're in a cool prison, whatever, you might have 13, 14 channels, you know, even sports channels. So... I know when you were inside, you watched a couple of things, but what was your favorite? Uh, I, it's a, it, you know, I was a young and a restless cat. You I know. remember you <laughs> loved your soaps, <laughs> your stories. You see, when we went out to Wisconsin, I was looking for Victor Newman. <laughs> Genoa City, you know. <laughs> I also remember um, those Spanish shows, which were quite popular inside, but you don't speak Spanish. So what's up with that? Well, I was trying to learn Spanish from watching the shows. And then I was realizing that, hey, this is a difference between American shows and Spanish shows. You know, they're like sexy and everybody <laughs> know that part. Now, I, I got guilty pleasure with uh, Enamoranos. Okay, so check it out. It's a Spanish dating show. And uh, I don't understand a lick of word they saying. But I'm watching it. <laughs> what are you watching, bro? Man, it's a... I'm just captivated. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Is anybody else watching this show with you? Oh, man, sometimes my cellie, he speaks Spanish. So sometimes I got to get him to join me with me so I can have an interpreter having, telling me what's going on. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hi, my name is Julian and I'm calling from New York. My question is, do people play video games in prison? I, I found it funny that they said, do people pay, play video games? And I'm like, okay, not while I was inside. This is our friend Sam Lewis. And I first met Sam when he strolled through San Quentin, suited and booted while I was incarcerated. And mm. I can say, Nige, when a, when a formerly incarcerated dude come back into the prison that then got out, they're successful, it's an inspiration to the rest of the individuals that's there serving time. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Sam served 24 years in prison. And Erlon, we always love the opportunity to talk with him. Yep. So not long ago, we drove all the way down to his office in L.A. to hit him up with a few of these questions. I was in prison from... 1988 to 2000, January 12, 2012. So you could have played Tetris. I played te Tetris before I went in. <laughs> That's my era, the Tetris years. Atari, <laughs> Coleco. What, what do you think people or guys did in prison to fill their time instead of video games? Like, what was the equivalent of video gaming if you didn't have the ability to video game? Oh, wow. Pinochle, chess. Spades, but once you play Pinochle, normally you don't even want to play Spades anymore. Backgammon. If you're lucky, you you have sometimes a floor officer that allow you to check out dice, and then they will make sure that you're not doing anything you shouldn't be doing with the dice. Ah. <laughs> like, Hit <Damn>. seven. <laughs> uh, what's that? Come on, you, you, you <laughs> dice, we, we can gamble right now. Nah. Seven Eleven, come out. See? 
I really, I enjoy chess. Now, I think it's it's a thinking person's game. Dominoes, pinochle, all of those are games of chance because you can't see what the other person has. On a chessboard, everything is right there in front of you. You know what a person can and can't do. The only question that you have to ask yourself, are you going to miss the move that that person is going to make? Is that person three or four or five moves ahead of you? And so it's like life. If you stay focused, you can be really good. I, I see that with everyone that's coming out that really knows what they want to do with their life. They stick to the script. They don't stop. They don't quit. And success is inevitable. That's why I like chess. E, when we first got this question, I thought, actual video games in prison? Mm, that's going to be a non-starter. I mean... <laughs> People don't have personal computers and like those fancy video game consoles that the young folks play with, right? Not so fast, Nige. Not so fast. Sam got out nine years ago. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there have been some changes since then. Nowadays, people have these tablets and they're kind of like, uh, I'll describe them as special prison iPads. That is being way too generous, or <laughs> one. I mean, it's not like they have the internet. Well, true, but they do come with some games on them. And if you got a little cheddar, you can add a whole lot of games. Call me Big Mike Sr. Big Mike, how long have you been down? Well, right now, it's been, what, three and a half years. I'll be going home soon. So let me ask you something, because when people think about video games in the street, they think about Xbox 360, PlayStation 17. Well, when you say video games, what you talking about? Like chess on the tablet. You know what I'm saying? Little solitaire, card games, stuff like that. It's not Xboxes or anything like that, but it's, you know, it's something that keeps me going, keeps me sane, you know, so that I won't be thinking about other things. You know, I won't be depressed. You know, I won't be mad at everything. So how many hours a day do you play video games? You want me to add them up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would say, uh, in all honesty, I would say 96 hours on and off. A day? Every day. There's only 24 hours in a day. I'll be up there playing in my sleep, loved one. <laughs> I was out in Arizona. We had Xbox, we had PlayStation, we had tablets, you know, we had it all out there. This is Norman Fisher, and he is actually talking about real video games. Because this was a private prison in Arizona where the rules were a little different, I'll say. We sat in our cells, just played uh, Madden 15. That's what I was out there, you know what I mean? Played Madden 15. I mastered that, you know what I mean? It was cool. So that's crazy. You had an Xbox in your cell? I had an Xbox in my cell. You had a PlayStation. Yeah, that was the easiest time I ever done. Having an Xbox in your cell, uh, Erlon, that's a pretty unusual situation. And an unfair one, too, Nigel. <laughs> I know. We're all serving yeah. time. Everybody should get that shit. <laughs> I hear you. But, E, we did talk to one guy who managed to do some pretty serious gaming while he was inside a state-operated prison in California. Yeah, and he had to er, um, uh, bend the rules a little <laughs> bit, shall we say. Yeah, I am a huge video game addict, and I used to play video games inside. This is Quan Nguyen. We actually met him because he sent us a copy of his book. Yep, it's called Sparrow in the Razor Wire, and it's about his life, including the 22 years he spent in prison. And while he was there, Quan was a huge gamer. I was part of this guild called Reservoir Dogs, and we were known as the Space Ninjas. And we were the number one ranked guild in the world, and there was one time that I was ranked number two in the world on combat experience. Wait, whoa, okay, wait a minute. Can you explain more about this? How could that be? Well, because I mean, it was funny because the guys on my guild, um, like you could have up to like 200 and something people on a guild. And so it's a real-time strategy game. It's like a military, economic, strategic simulation. We, let's say we launched tonight at 12 a.m. Eight-hour flight to go into this galaxy. We have to be online at 8 a.m. Oh my God, E. This guy, he was so intense. As he was talking, I just pictured him in like a command chair taking care of this whole game universe. Yeah, and he wasn't using one of those prison tablets to do all that either. Nope. Quan had a phone in his prison cell, which is very much against the rules. 
So you're playing like on a little cell phone screen? Yeah, I had my very first one I remember that was playing that game on was the Blackberry Pearl. Uh, and chatting. Do that on a little screen? I don't. I, I did it on the screen. I mean, I think we're spoiled now, but that's how it was for me. There are like 200 guys in this video game guild. Quan is the only one of them who's incarcerated. And Quan knew that if he got caught with that cell phone, it'd be gone, and he'd be out the game. So he thought he better warn the guy in charge of the guild. I go, hey, this is a real possibility that I could lose this phone. And by that time, I built a, a pretty big account. So I gave him the passcodes to it. I go, if my phone gets taken, here's the passcode so you guys could log on. If I never get a phone again, then you have this account that's pretty impressive and you guys could, that's for the guild. So Wow. And when I, get, when I walked away, that's when I, I, I gifted the, my account to the guild. So when I came home, I contacted them. They said, where have you been? Are you ready to join us? You ready to play again? I said, no way. It takes up too much of my time. Did it help you with your time there to be doing so much of that? Yeah, it, it, that was a great escape for me. And I think it gave me a sense of community and where I belong. Like suddenly I'm not only part of this community, I'm out of community that accepts me and, and I excel in this community. And it, 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 it's based on a lot of my strengths that, uh, and talent I could bring. And I feel like I fit in with these group of guys for once. <laughs> Next week. Next week. Next week. Ruben Hernandez, how do you feel about being called an inmate? Nah, I definitely don't like being called an inmate. Or... How, how would you prefer people refer to us? By our names. We're human beings just like anybody else. This conversation came out of a question we got from Ear Hustle listener Ray in my home state of Massachusetts. Ray wanted to know, what are the words or phrases used about incarcerated people that aren't cool? Yeah, and I know for our colleague New York, there's a couple of terms at the top of his list. Inmate and prisoner. New York does not use those terms. I say incarcerated people because people is the noun. Incarcerated just describes where the noun is at, where I'm at. Uh-huh. Right? When you start saying prisoner, prisoner becomes a noun. Don't incarcerated person does the same thing? No, you, no. So, because it reminds you I am a person. I mean, every time you every say it. Time you say and, it. Because and and when you forget that we're people, uh-huh. you don't treat us like people. Arthur Jackson, who's also incarcerated at San Quentin, has a whole nother take on this matter. I believe that we should be addressed as exactly what we are, prisoners. Why do you say prisoners? Because that's what we are. I think I, I, I take exception to uh, such uh, terms as incarcerated person because that nicens up actually what we're in, what condition we're in and what conditions we're suffering from. Inmate is a term that's referred to mental patients. And so why not call us prisoners? That's what we are. And I tell society exactly what we're dealing with. We're in prison. We are prisoners. My question is, while in prison, what is the proudest moment you've had? Tor in Alberta, Canada, thanks for this one. We thought we'd run it by our friend Sam Lewis. For me, it was when I graduated from college. Uh, my mom, ever since I was a kid, always pushed education. And when I went went into prison, I was a high school dropout, and I could barely read and write. And my mom would send me all of these books, and then she would ask me to write her about the books. Man, child from the promised land, uh, native son, a, a lot of different literature. And then we it switched from her sending me books to get me interested to what kind of books do you want. Pretty soon, Sam started taking college courses. And now there are a lot more programs that help incarcerated people go to college while they're in prison. But it was a lot harder back then. I had to, like, smuggle books in. There were a number of different things I had to do to to get my textbooks at times. You couldn't have hardcovers. I remember having to take exams with my back to a door where they just had a huge race ride. And every time the door opened, I have to look over my shoulder. At one point, Sam's getting ready to take his exams when he finds out he's being transferred to another prison. And sometimes when you're transferred, your property gets lost in the mix. And it might take months before you see that shit again. So in the course of moving, 
Sam got separated from all the books he needed to study. The exam that I was actually taking was for statistics. And I had a, a window of time that I had to take this exam. And I remember being really, really upset that they did this to me. Finally, 10 days before the exam, his books show up. And so I crammed as best I could and was in a panic. It was the only C that I ever got in college. Mm. The only C. I, I, I never dropped a great lord in that. And I remember telling my older sister how upset I was about it. My older sister said, you shouldn't be upset. And I was like, why? It's like a blemish on my record. And she said, no, it's not. She said, you persevered. And so those are my proudest moments. The accomplishment, not because of the system, despite the system, being able to overcome and, and do those things. Sam got his diplomas. Two of them. That's right. An associate's degree and a bachelor's. Go, Sam. I think for me, it was being able to send it to my mom uh, and have her have it so she could see that her son was working toward becoming the man that she always knew I could become. My name is Reggie. Been down for 23 years, and my proudest moment in prison is when I discovered that I was the only African American inside of the institution that was taking a calculus or calculus two course. And I saw that calculus two course, and I just ignored it. I was not even thinking about taking it, bro. What made you t- sign up for that good time? Since I started tutoring. GED students, I felt that I needed to excel in that area of math just in case somebody else might need to get tutored in a higher mathematics. Well, my name is James Humphrey. I've been down seven and a half years, and my most proudest moment in, while I've been incarcerated is when I married my wife after knowing that um, looking at um, 70 or 25 in life, and she married me before I even went to trial. And what's your proudest moment since you've been in prison? When I completed building maintenance. When I get in there, I'm like, man, I'm just trying to just get past this. I'm not really feeling this. Three months into it, we get a contract from Monterey County to build the uh, mini home projects for the homeless. After the first house that we built, I was addicted to building houses. I'm like, what's the next project? What's the next project? What's the next project? I would have to say my proudest moment when I was in prison was when I had to remind my mom that I committed the murder and that there was another mom that was suffering more than she was. This is Quan again. He's the video game master we heard before. Why was that your proudest moment? Because I think my whole life I had always... um, made excuses or or justified a lot of things that I did. And I think my mom and family members being what they are, they basically uh, enabled me in a certain sense. Um, Did your mom not believe that you had done what you did? Yeah, well, I told her I didn't do it. And uh, she attended every day at my trial. Um, And just to give you context, I shot and killed another man by the name of Min Nguyen um, in 1999 in Los Angeles. And I went to trial. I lied at trial. I had already um, got rid of evidence and I coached witnesses. So they originally tried me for the death penalty, but um, because there wasn't enough evidence and everything like that, they I was ultimately found guilty of second degree murder. And the jury did not believe that I was the shooter. So I just held on to that for those years. And I think my mom, of course, what mom wants to say that her son committed murders. But I think there was a part of her that always knew, but didn't want to admit it to herself, too. And I just told her, like, Mom, like, you do realize what I'm in prison for, right? And that's when my mom, like, cried and said no. And I said, let's just be happy that I'm better now. And uh, let's be happy that um, I am alive and that we could hug and, and, you know, spend time with each other. I go, there's another woman just like you that's lost her son that cannot do this.
Can you tell us what your proudest moment was while you were in prison? I have many proud moments uh, during my incarceration, but my proudest moment was when I saw my youngest son for the first time since my incarceration. It had been 17 years. We've had Romarilyn Ralston on Catch a Kite before. I met her at San Quentin. Oh, yeah? Yeah, she was at an educational uh, seminar. Where Marilyn is really focused on education, she works for an organization called Project Rebound. Project Rebound helps formerly incarcerated individuals get their college degrees. And it's a great organization. But before she worked for Project Rebound, Romarilyn spent 23 years in prison. And for the first 17 of those years, she didn't see her son. He was two years old when I was arrested and sentenced to life in prison. And when he walked into prison to visit me for the first time, he was 19 in his Marine Corps uniform. When he walked through the door, you know, the the idea of him in my head was this two-year-old baby. And now he's a 6'4", you know, chocolate brown man. And I had to get on my tippy toes to to give him a hug. And I'm tall. I'm, You're tall, I'm almost yeah. six foot myself, so... Uh, It was amazing. We just walked around the visiting room and held hands and kind of looked at each other because, you know, he had grown into this this man that looked a lot like me. (laughs) Do you remember like how he smelled or any like any of those other details? Because like children, they have a smell and you remember it, even if it's been a long time. Do you remember if he had any familiar smell? Well, he was all cologne down. So (laughs) the aftershave was smelling. (laughs) Yeah. But I do remember what the hug felt like. If I were to describe it, it just kind of felt like walking out into the warm sun. You know, and, and, you know, when you feel that warmth and you kind of hold yourself, that's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like a mother again. It had been a long time. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, STEMI checks and the prison economy. Good evening, you hustle. I'm from London, and my name is Eddie. This guy sounds kind of familiar. Eddie from London is a regular on our Catch a Kite episodes. And Eddie, it's great to hear from you again. My question is, since COVID, what has changed regarding the economy in prison? Thank you very much. I hope I find you both well. When our colleague New York brought this question to the guys on the yard at San Quentin, there was one thing everyone was talking about. Stimulus checks. Yes, that's right. Incarcerated men and women can now receive stimulus checks as long as they are qualified and they file a claim with the IRS. And as a result, a bunch of incarcerated guys at San Quentin have gone from having nothing on their books to having something like a thousand bucks. And suddenly, everyone's balling. Everything at the commissary sold out. All the stimulus checks here, it's like uh, Christmas. Those who did get stimulus checks. Me, myself, I didn't get one. I'm still broke. But uh, people who did get stimulus checks, you know, they were able to go to the canteen, get what they want, get the hygiene, order packages. That canteen, man, they got limits now. Everybody balling. So now you can only buy five macros and they out of 50 items. Every- so now you can only get two of everything. Maybe three of this, three of that. But, you know, it's fair for everybody, you know, to get at least something they want. You know? This actually dovetails with another question we got about how much money an incarcerated person needs on their books to pay for stuff that they need, like extra food or hygiene, you know, items like deodorant and toothpaste. So Erlon, why don't you answer that one? How much money did you feel like you needed per month in prison? I'll say it like this. You can have as much money as you want on your account, Mm -hmm. right? 
but you definitely have to budget that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like technically you can spend $220 a month in a canteen. Right. But you definitely don't need to spend two twenty a month every month. You know what I'm saying? So me, I used to just spend like 30, 40 bucks. All depends. And there's a couple of ways that people get money on their books. Right. You can have a job inside that pays or your family members or your friends on the outside can actually put money on your books. I do always wonder about what happens to the guys in prison that don't have anything. Like no family, no one's putting money on their books. Well, for those guys, it's hella tough. Those are the cats that got to have a hustle or they just, Mm. you know, going to be begging. What's your name and how long you been incarcerated? Uh, my name is Elton Lewis Spencer. I've been incarcerated 20 years, going on my 21st year. What's the longest you have gone without money on your book? Uh, about five years, six, six years. Straight? Straight. How did you survive? Like, what is life like when you have no outside support in prison? How did I survive? Just uh, as far as getting my three meals a day and friends and people I meet, you know, hand me, give me a little soup here, uh, rice here, some, you know. And I just maintain. Most of the time I fast a lot, eating fruits, different stuff like that, my vegetables, uh, salads, and stuff like that. And I fast. So on them days when... They got that kind of meal at child where nobody wants and everybody's giving their food away. Do you eat all that stuff nobody else wants? I pick over what, you know, like salads and stuff, you know, peas and beans and stuff that they don't want, I eat. I'm from Texas and I was raised up on that. Uh, do you feel like you could survive indefinitely off the state? No. Uh, not, no. No. Because they don't even feed you proper. You know, I got diabetes right now from eating this stuff that the state feed you. And it's all carbs. A gang of carbs. Everything you get is a gang of carbs. So let me ask you this. How has your life changed since they've been giving out stimulus checks? Well, uh, really, my life is still messed up because <laughs> they taking the money They give me the money, and then they want to take the money. And they wasn't supposed to. I'm down to three cents. I still got three cents on my books right now because they took the money from the stimulus for the restitution that I shouldn't even be paying the restitution because I didn't tell the police to chase me and tear up his car. I didn't tell him to chase me. I didn't wreck my car. He wrecked his car. They couldn't just let you get away. They had to, like, apprehend Huh. Yeah, well, that, that, he apprehended me out two months later because he had my license on. But I didn't tell him to try to burn, bend the corner like I bent the corner and didn't hit nothing. But he tore up the street. He tore his car up and everything, but I got to pay $80,000. $80,000? Yeah, they want to charge me for his wreck. Hey y'all, this is Emily from Portland, Oregon. You might not be able to answer this one, but I've always been curious about menstruation and prison. Thanks, Emily. And of course we can answer that one. We brought it to Alyssa Moore, who was just released from prison in August of 2020. So can you tell me how long you actually were in prison? Um, Just over 23 years. And how old were you when you I was 17. Um, at the beginning of my incarceration and 41 when I was released. Okay. All right. Can you talk a little bit about how, what was different between having your period on the outside and having it inside prison? Um, One of the major differences is that usually outside, it's a private matter. You know, you always see in the movies when you send your boyfriend or your brother or some male family member to go buy tampons or pads. And it's hilarious, right? Well, like in real life, it's not that hilarious to have to ask a male for, you know, sanitary supplies. So you would get your period and then you'd have to go to a CO and ask every time. 
for either tampons or pads? Well, it just depends on the type of incarceration too. Like, are you in solitary confinement? Um, Is the institution low on those items? Have you bled heavy? Have you used your allotted amount? And what do you mean your allotted amount? Well, they have, uh, you know, a certain amount that, that each unit orders. And some staff will order plentifully Mm -hmm. because they probably have daughters or wives. And then some are just not trying to do anything above. So they order less. And then that means there's less to go around. The inmates that are in charge of passing it out get their issue. So Mm -hmm. they take as much as they want. And then there's even less for the population. But it's someone else deciding what your needs are, like how heavy your period is or making the assumption of what you would need. Absolutely. And it's probably a man. Yeah. And a stranger at that. So what do you do if you run out of of products? Some people are issued them, you know, people that have obviously went through menopause Mm -hmm. and they'll sell them. And that's just something you learned along the way. Like how much, it would, um, like what it should cost, um, you know, in quotation yeah. marks. Yeah. Well, everything in prison is $5. <laughs> you know, whether it's a bag of tampons or a roll of trash bags or new sheets or a new pair of state tennis shoes, it's all $5. Are you talking about trading like $5 worth of soup? Yeah, $5 worth of items okay. From, okay. from the canteen or our care packages. Right. I remember when I got really bad period camps, like the best thing was to take a hot bath, which oh, yeah. I which I know is not available when you're in prison. Right. So were there any other, like, were there any, any things like that you could do to comfort yourself? We would get black market trash bags, um, fill them up with hot water and put like a, t- a, w- a towel in there and use that sort of like a hot water bottle. If we come out of our cell for any reason, we're strip searched. They need to have us bend at the waist and open our vaginal and anal cavities so they can shine a flashlight in there and verify that we don't have any um, objects hidden in there. Let's say they feel something in that area. They want to know what it is immediately. And you have no choice but to be like, oh, it's a pad, it's a cotex. or And some of them want to see, you know, because they don't believe you. Ooh, nah, I, yeah. you know, I thought the men used to go through some shit. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It seemed like shit. Nobody liked these searches. No. I mean, I've heard that from so many men inside. But for some reason, hearing Alyssa talk about it, it was really tough. And it clearly took a toll on her. Even now, like that I'm older and I'm I'm out here, like I'm pretty lackadaisical about, you know, clothing. I have no modesty or humility left. Like that was stripped away from me at such a young age. These essential things that would would make me shy or modest or Mm -hmm. any of that were stripped away from me. So I don't even have today as an adult those feelings. Are there things inside that people want to talk about, but they don't because it's just too painful. Big thanks to Benjamin from Ann Arbor, Michigan for calling in with that question. We brought it to Romarilyn Roston. The main thing is your crime. You know, that's, that's the number one no-no. You don't ask people what they're in for. Um, were you ever curious about any why someone got to prison, even though you couldn't ask? Did you ever look at someone and be like, I just want to know. Oh, I wanted to know a lot, but I never asked. You know, I never asked. When you lose somebody you love. This again is Sam Lewis. And while Sam was incarcerated, a friend of his, another incarcerated guy, found out his mother had passed away. We didn't talk about it. We just sat on the tier. He cried. And we drank coffee. And that was it. Like, th- just me being there to support him, that was it. You get a phone call, can't go to the funeral, there's nothing you can do. So you don't necessarily talk about how much you miss someone, how painful it is, how, how hurt you are that you feel that you let that person down. You don't talk about those things, you internalize them. 
but you don't talk about them. What's up, Ear Hustle? This is Gina from New York. I work at Mount Sinai Hospital doing transplant research, and I'm so curious to know if incarcerated persons are allowed to be organ donors, both living or if they die in prison. We had to do some reporting on this one, didn't we, Not? Yes, we did. And we found out that incarcerated people, just like everybody else, can designate whether or not they want their organs donated after they die. In terms of living donations, like a kidney, that's a little more complicated. In California, incarcerated people are allowed to donate organs to family members only. And they or their family have to cover the costs of the surgery, transportation, and any other costs that come up. Our colleague, New York, went out on the yard to talk to some guys about it. Have you ever tried to donate an organ from prison? No, I've never tried to, but however, I was talking to my daughter and I really want She's got a 70% on one kidney and the other kidney's pretty much gone. So I was thinking, man, that would be a great... Great to be able to help my daughter with a kidney, but I know I've never heard of anybody doing it, so I never pursued it. But it's something that I have to live with being incarcerated. I can't even, if I was a match, I couldn't even give my daughter an organ. Yeah, I tried it. They wouldn't let me do it for my step pops and for my homegirl, Sika, and then Sika died. There's a, there's a good handful of us that would love to give back to, to the community and save a life. You know what I mean, we're most a lot of us won't have the opportunity to be out in freedom again, you know, and to help anybody to live a life, a legit life would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I saw this movie by, by Will, starring Will Smith called Seven Pounds, and in it, he found seven worthy people uh, to donate his organs to, um, who, because he had killed seven people in a car accident. And wow. so he ended up, like, committing suicide in a way where his organs were preserved, and he saved seven lives to make up for the seven he took. I always thought that was an awesome thing. I think if you did, I would do anything for, or... Any child. I mean, I'm going to grow old and probably die in here. To give my organs to, so somebody can have a, an awesome life out there, that seems like that's all that's left. Why not? Hey, you know what? Instead of just growing old and dying in here, I could help somebody else live a, a, an awesome life out there. Thanks to Danny, Julian, Rachel, Tor. Eddie, Mary, Benjamin, Emily, and Gina for their questions. And we want to thank Saleh, Ro, JC, Tommy, and the other currently and formerly incarcerated men and women who answered questions for us. Good luck. And also, a big thanks to everybody who sent in questions that we didn't get to on the show. I mean, all of the questions are so great. And Erlon, you know... I love reading all of them because they are endlessly fascinating. All 30,000 of them you love reading. <laughs> yeah, I do. And there are people who ask about all kinds of stuff to make you go, hmm, never thought about that. Oh, totally. We'll do more Catch a Kites in the future, so please keep sending us those questions. Yes, we love getting them. And don't forget about one thing, Nige. What's that? Your book, The San <laughs> Quentin Project. You can find out more information about that on our website, yourhustlesq.com. I'm going to go find out now. Ear Hustle would like to thank Carl Buis and Terry Thornton at the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Ear Hustle is produced by the empathic Nigel Paul, a man that in London we would call a diamond geezer, Erlon Woods, and the trio of greats, Rasan, New York Thomas, John Yaya Johnson, and Bruce Wallace. This episode was sound designed and engineered by Antoine Williams with music by Antoine, Maserati E, and David Yarsi. They are the creators of Clarity, musical maestros, and sound sculptors of Ear Hustle. Amy Standen edits the show, Shubnam Sigmund is our digital producer, and Julie Shapiro is the executive producer for Radiotopia. Thanks to acting ward and Ron Broomfield, and as you know, every episode of Ear Hustle has to be approved by this guy here, a man whose voice is so smooth you could lay it flat and ice skate on it. It's the esteemed Lieutenant Sam Robinson. Hey, Eddie, I, I, much love, brother, much love. <laughs> and so with that, thank you, Eddie. And I will say that this is Lieutenant Sam Robinson at San Quentin State Prison, and I approve this episode. 
This podcast was made possible with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, working to redesign the justice system by building power and opportunity for communities impacted by incarceration. Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Radiotopia is a collection of independent, listener-supported podcasts. Some of the best podcasts around. Hear more at radiotopia.fm. I'm Nigel Poor. I'm Erlon Woods. Thanks Thanks for for listening. listening. Eddie floored me, man. I, you know, I'm 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 pretty dark skinned, and uh, I, normally I don't show red, but I'm sure if I had a camera in front of me uh, and anybody was next to me when I heard that, I, <laughs> I would have been blushing all over the place, man. Radio Tokyo.